Welcome everybody. Um, it's been a brilliant morning so far. Today we've now got Gary Hats Hudson, who's the Head of Advanced Analytics from Arden and, Arden and Gem Commissioning Support Unit. He's going to talk to us about how computer vision can assist clinicians. Gary's background is in advanced analytics. His passions are machine, deep learning, computer vision and generating program and general programming concepts. He's been using R for eight years to provide various solutions to a number of his problems. Career-wise, he's the head of advanced analytics at Arden and Gem CSU. Prior to that, he worked for a leading predictive healthcare analytics company called Draper and Dash. And prior to that, he's got a career based in public in the public sector for the NHS and Nottinghamshire Police. So I will hand over to Gary now to take us through how computer vision can assist clinicians. Hi guys, brilliant to be here. Um, as I said, the presentation of the title is Computer Vision, so algorithms to aid clinicians. Um, like you say, what I will have is some useful insights and uh, shareable code. What I won't have is beautifully presented slides in our model. Um, so can, what is computer vision? So what I'll be focusing on today is um, classification and object detection as an example at the end of the slide. But there's various other types of uh, computer vision type um, uh, projects and predictions. So classification, as I've said, um, like you say, you've probably all seen the cats and dogs example, those that have actually studied this area. I'm gonna actually try and work with a more real, real life data set, and I'll get onto that shortly. But yeah, there's other things like uh, picking out pixelations in backgrounds and semantic segmentation and incident segmentation and classification and localization. So that's the difference being that you actually draw a bounding box and you detect an object before you classify. So the applicability to healthcare then. So there's lots of real good examples of where computer vision has been used in the live environment in practice. So aiding clinicians with uh, identification of problems faster ID, e.g. sorry, at Mount Sinai Hospital, this has been used to detect uh, neurological acute illness. Again, 40,000 CT scans were used from across the health si healthcare system, and it required them to have kind of a joined up data sharing approach. And that kind of needs to be in place, uh, like I think Sarah Corkin mentioned um, in her, her talk a couple of days ago around a chesting imaging database. So essentially we need that for more different scan types and there needs to be the ability to have these algorithms that can, that can be trained on larger data sets. This can, again, more pre precise diagnoses. So computer vision algorithms can be trained on massive amounts of data um, to, to detect the slightest presence of a condition. And sometimes human doctors might miss these out. So I turn these as uh, clinical uh, decision-making aids. Uh, they're not there to replace uh, clinical decision-makers. Again, medical imaging, um, there's been seen increases in CV applications. I think DeepMind and Google were looking at uh, working with a few more field eye hospital around ophthalmology as well. But there's a lot of novel applications reading the research around binary, binary and multi-class algorithms. Um, I'll show you a, an example of how image recognition, so object detection can be used in practice. Um, this might be more applicable to surveillance systems, but uh, I'll get onto that at the end of my discussion. So R and computer vision then. So it's been made possible by um, the the kind of combination of Python's existing libraries, TensorFlow and Keras. Before that, you could only really use H2O and uh, Amazon's MXNet to do these kind of projects. Um, R, TensorFlow and Keras has now been uh, kind of fully embedded um, under the Reticulate package, which was written by JJ Allaire. And again, I think we're going to cover that in January. So what's the convolutional neural network then? So essentially, you might have heard of deep learning and something called the multi-layer perceptron and neural networks. Essentially, a convolutional neural network is a, that piece together, but it's, it's used to solve image detection problems. So on the left, you've got an image. It convolves over the image in a, a matrix um, type stride, and it will look at each pixel, one pixel at a time in that image. And then it does that across how many images you've got, it pulls that into a matrix, then it convolves it and collapses it down to something called a, a pooling layer. Then you create something called a densely connected layer, and that's where your neural network comes into play, i.e. the number of ne hidden neurons that you expose will then give you the, your output predictions. 
So this is a, effectively an animation um, plagiarized from a, a, one of the websites that I found of how uh, convolutional neural networks work. As you can see, there's a, a kind of a matrix that strides over the image. This matrix then gets max pulled and reduced down into the middle green box. And then you can see this is from the MNIST data set on the right. You can see where the image occurs from, like you say, the, where the sparse values are compared to where the higher values are. Again, if you want to get into this area, um, I, I picked this book up um, a while ago just for a reference point of view. I have been working in this area for quite a long time, but a lot of my um, applications have been work, um, written in Python. So I needed a way to actually translate that over. And when JJ Allaire came up and wrote this book, I was over the moon. So yeah, check it out. So building a CNN in R then, a convolutional neural network in R. So there's, this article uh, will be published in my website in terms of a tutorial on how I went about building this network, but it's based on a uh, Kaggle malaria cell data set. So it looks at the, the presence of a parasite infection over uh, on an uninfected cell. And again, it's essentially a binary classification task. This model, again, like I said, could be worked, extended to work with multiple types of X-rays, cancer scans, imaging detection, um, to detect the presence of illness, et cetera, and disease. The next few slides will take you through my kind of thought process of building the model. So what we needed to do, first of all, is examine the images. So these are what the images look like. Again, the presence of the parasite is quite small in the cell on the left-hand side. And the uninfected cell kind of gives you an, an area to uh, convolve over as well. Um, again, I've said that this, my website gives you an example of how to build this end to end. And I've also included all my code in a GitHub repository that will be attached to this as part of the, our community. The next thing was to actually, I wanted to take 100 images and start doing some animation on the cells to see actually where, where do the different parasites occur and how different are the objects, um, the actual classification tasks and how different are the pictures and whereabouts the presence of malaria was. So I did this over a sample of 100 images using the magic package. And again, this is all implemented in the tutorial and the example code. But essentially, you could see then that there are images whereby you could start to detect the presence of a parasite based on its coloration. You could collapse that down and do some kind of more advanced imaging like watershed detection and all that kind of stuff. This doesn't get into that, but there's lots of interesting websites whereby you could actually go to to find that. So activation functions then. So an activation function in neural network shows how it's actually the start, how it's going to be classified and which neurons are going to be activated and which ones aren't. The kind of popular one is um, something called the rectified linear unit. This um, is a, a piecewise linear function and the actual benefit of this is it allows your network to train really fast, i.e. it can turn off those hidden nodes really quickly. It doesn't have to kind of solve, um, approximate or solve uh, those values like the tan H and um, sigmoid and other types of activation functions. And it also solves a problem called the uh, vanishing gradient problem. This is all linked on my website as well. And then at the output, so this works very much like a binary classification task. We're going to do a, uh, a kind of sigmoid classification. So we're going to say whether it's got a parasite in it or not. And that's, that's when it becomes a binary classification task. And again, I've put links to all this to read around it if you need to. Um, the convolutional layer looks like this. And this is what a simple convolutional neural network looks like. So you've got the convolutional layer. I've put a uh, hyperlink there so you can click around and understand what it's about. But the premise of this is um, we essentially apply something called a feature map. So that's where you see the filters. And the feature maps like trying to draw out all the different features in that image. So some might be detecting line segments, some might be detecting the boundary, some might be detecting the parasite, the shape of the parasite, etc. We then build that up. So we go a bit deeper. So we then apply more filters. So it starts 32, then we take it to 64. Uh, we, we put the input shape. So we, we highlight what the image height and width is and the number of color channels. In this instance, it's going to be RGB. So there'll be three color channels. We do the same again. So then what I've done is a 32, 64, 64, collapsed it back down, and then essentially flattened that down to a one dimensional matrix. We've then collapsed that down further. So you can then classify whether that parasite is uh, present or not. And that's that dense layer that you can see at the bottom um, with the sigmoid activation, as we've just discussed on the previous slide. 
And then what we then apply is something called a dropout layer. I've I've put a link in um, to Jeffrey Hinton's uh, lecture when he created dropout layers. He's the kind of godfather of neural networks. He probably will explain it better than I. But essentially, it just drops out hidden layers at random by 50% or whatever uh, kind of ratio you specify. The next thing to do is compile your um, convolutional neural net. So we're going to use uh, binary cross-entropy. So if you know anything about information theory, uh, Shannon cross-entropy, that kind of thing, uh, you need to look that up. But essentially, it's a binary classification task, and that's the, uh, the loss that we need to indicate. The optimizer, so there's a lot of different optimizers. I've linked there just so I don't go into it in too great depth. But that kind of aims to minimize the loss uh, in each of the, the kind of epochs. And then we're going to monitor the metrics as accuracy. What I like about Keras is it's got a functionality called flow images from a directory. So you can essentially organize your data structure in a test and train structure, drop all your images in there. So those that belong in the parasite infected image, those that belong in an unaffected uh, category. And then that essentially uh, builds the classification labels for you. So this flow images from directory after it's been rescaled. Obviously, we want to um, make it uh, fall between zero and one. So we need to rescale the it by the number of pixels that are present in each image. That's 255. So one divided by 255 will give you that uh, area where you can classify it. And essentially, then you use this functionality to um, create the train and test data sets for your, uh, your deep learning model. The next step is to fit the objects, um, and we're going to indicate the steps per epoch and the number of epochs it want to go on, go through in each neural net. So an epoch is a epoch is a complete pass through each uh, each time. So it goes through the whole data, and it does that for fifty times. And the steps per epoch is the number of steps it takes through the network and the number of back propagations. And again, read about uh, back propagations in neural nets. There's lots of information in the, the deep learning book I linked there. And then we're going to pass in the validation. So we want to validate it on actual test data. Keras can do all that for you. In terms of saving the model then, so we're going to save the model as a H5 object. Uh, the H5 is a resident in Python, obviously, because this has been interfa interfaced with the Python library. You need to make sure that you save the objects in Python and reticulate handles that for you. Um, the first instance of that, I call this my baseline model. You can see that actually on the bottom, uh, the bottom chart, there's lots of variance on the top. There's lots of loss. It's not really detecting the presence of uh, the parasite at all. Uh, you might as well just flip a coin. It's about 50%. So how I improved that? There's something called um, data augmentation. So what it does, it's, it will take all the images. It will do like rotation. It will potentially zoom in. You can resize, et cetera, rescale it. And essentially, it's then going to do a synthetically set of generated images. And I found that quite simply by zooming into this network, um, I could actually really get some massive accuracy gain on the Kaggle data set. And again, this is not an easy problem to solve. I've linked in the help in case you need to uh, look at additional options that you can use here. But then essentially, that will then um, kind of augment my, uh, my train data set. So then what I've done after that is I've added another couple of um, 2D convolutional layers and um, a number of max pooling layers. So I've gone from 32 to 64 to 1 to 8, just taking it up in size um, to a multitude of two. Um, finally, I flattened that out. I create a densely connected layer of 512 neurons. So there's then lots of features that we can pick from. And then I then collapse it back down to a, a sigmoidal classification task and add that dropout layer, as I said previously. So from that, I then fitted the augmented model. I've taken the steps per epoch down a little bit and the number of epochs to go through the neural net. Again, there are rules around uh, batch size and the, the number of epochs that you should need. So it's the size of your date training data set divided by the number of batches that you've got, so the batch size you dictate, which then indicate the number of epochs that you need to go through the network. I can, I've can i linked some of that in my blog post earlier. Um, one thing to note, there's neural networks are prone to overfitting. So Keras has got this cool functionality where it will monitor one of the loss functions for you. And it's something called early stopping. And it's kind of recommended as a default to stop your neural network overfitting. 
So the callback uh, statement there, callback early stopping needs to be added. And again, like you say, this is now a model with those augmented images. So I've got my existing images in the training data set and those that have been augmented through that augmentation process. Then with no deep learning, you wait and you wait and you wait. So it might be term sexy, but a lot of the time you spend a lot of time waiting for your GPU just to ramp up and your CPU to burn, burn out on your laptop or machine. Um, then the Keras automatically defaults these kind of plots. I'm starting to get a lot better representation. So I can see from my top chart that actually, you know, the loss is starting to be detected. It's starting to decrease with each, uh, each epoch and my accuracy if i meet uh, average that out starts to get up to about 70 percent on the uh, eighth or ninth epoch averaged out this model's improved from about 50 percent to 69 percent so then we've got it's still not great it could still be improved further, further but we've got something that we can now use in practice so now this is where it can help your clinicians so say i've got new scanned images that come come through and say I want to do that in a batch. I'm going to process this one just for the sake of example as a, a batch of one, but you could do it as a whole batch of images. And essentially, they're all stored in something called uh, arrays, so arrays in Python. Um, and this this similar kind of it does the conversion for you automatically through reticulate. But I'm going to select the hundredth index. So I'm going to treat this as a new image in the pred image uh, for the train parasite label. I'm going to load that in using the image load functionality that's existing in Reticulate and Keras. Uh, I'm going to use the image to array to make it an array, so to make it a, a numerical representation, so to look at all the weights in that array. I'm going to reshape that array um, by the one. So I've got one new image that I'm putting through by the image shape. So the image shape is the, the height, the width, and the number of color channels present. That then creates something called a tensor. And that's where the term TensorFlow comes from, essentially a four-dimensional uh, matrix or vector. And then the image tensor gets divided to, again, scale the output between 0 and 1. I'm then going to plot that as a raster, so a raster image. If you know anything about uh, image processing, it essentially takes the location, height, width, uh, and all the borders of the image, and it will plot that out. And I'm going to take the first from that tensor. It will be the first image because it will only be one, the first index to give me all that information. That will then appear on the top right, as you can see. Then I can then uh, predict which uh, class this image belongs to. So I've created a little predict function there. Weirdly in Keras, so the flow images from directory functionality will um, will order it and assign a classification label of 0 or 1, dependent on the alphabetical ordering of it. So I wanted my parasite class to be 1, actually and my own effect to be zero, but it's actually done it the other way around. So I've had to use a little bit of uh, mutate case when statement to set if it if it's a zero, then it's parasite class, otherwise it's uninfected. And then I can get the classification label uh, for that particular instance. As you can see now, we, we can see that that's, that belongs to the parasite class, and you can quite clearly see that the parasite is present in the cell. Again, this can be used, again, for the presence of cancer, um, different types of imaging devices, etc. So what I could do to uh, further improve this model, so we had it about 69%, 70%. There's other types of models that you can use, other types of architectures in terms of how many different uh, feature maps you put on there and how many different um, hidden layers you use. So there's something called the Inception model, the ResNet model, MobileNet, you can read all those different types. And again, there's something called, my son would love this, there's something called a transformer network, he loves Optimus Prime. That's the new trend. Um, apparently, that can replace and really add a lot of value in this space. It's very new, and the paper I've linked in there, so you can have a look. Um, the problem here is a lot of the time they'll, they'll talk about pre-trained networks um, for this type of classification task. That works if the image exists in uh, Google, because that's normally where they mine the images from the ImageNet repository from. But for this, there's no real collation of scan images apart from what Siri Corkin identified in the chest X-ray data set. I think we need to expand that out, and this kind of acts as a call, call to arms for that. Other things like uh, the use of uh, leaky relus, I've linked this in my site. I won't go into it in greater depth. 
but that allows for some negative variation in um, that activation function that you saw earlier. And again, that gets quite in depth mathematically. So I've linked that there. Further image adjustments and image augmentation can be done uh, to detect images more clearly, as shown with what I did with the adjustment of the zoom on the particular image. So Gary, you've got four minutes left. Okay. I'll go, I'll quickly go through. <laughs> so CV then, so computer vision, R versus Python, the struggle. So object detection, open CV works a lot better in Python. And you can do stuff like integration into Raspberry Pis, et cetera. I put an example of uh, something that I did on the next slide, working on a project. Again, this is never really going to be used, but I'll, I'll get onto that in a second. Facial recognition, again, Python uh, wins on this front. Oz Video Play R is the kind of implementation of OpenCV for um, kind of object detection and facial recognition, but it's got a lot of the class modules missing. Um, and video, video streaming and capture can be done on both platforms, but it's still more fluid in Python. But alas, um, with Reticulate, you can actually bring those Python libraries through. Um, and I will, like I said, there is, there is a webinar planned, not, not yet uh, prepped, around how you can um, mangle your code with R and Python in Reticulate. And we use an example of uh, using the Ski Kit Learn library. But again, back onto task, the use of convolutional networks, as you've seen, I worked on this project for about an hour. I got the model uh, really increased in performance from 50% to about 70%. If I had a bit more time and I had a bit more thought around how I could deploy this, uh, I could improve it even further. I'm, I'm positive. So one last thing, this is object detection. So as the bounding box, as you saw earlier, and this is a social distancing detector. So I worked on this as a project when I was learning object detection. I've never wanted to really use it in practice, but I sourced this video off the internet. It's a video of a UK high street. I wanted to detect where um, you know social distancing was being enacted and where it was being violated. So you can see the two guys here, the two people in red, they're violating the two meter rule because it was trained under that. You can see the guys in green, they do actually try and adhere to it, but then people cut across them and then they violate it, you know, not on purpose, but that's that's when it happens. Uh, and then it, at the bottom, you can't see it in the crowd cast is sharing your screen, but it actually counts the number of violations every, every second, every minute. That, that could then be piped through to some control center somewhere. Again, this seems like big brother, I was never gonna use this in practice but it's uh, a way that object detection could be used in the real life environment. Okay, so that's me done. Hopefully that was uh, informative uh, and yeah, time for questions. Thank you so much. That was really clear and easy to follow and really quite technical as well. So I think you did a really good job of that. And I love that bit at the end with the um, social distancing. Um, yeah, that's right, that's, yeah, that's <laughs> fab. We've only got one question in the, chat or they we've only got one question the question answers which is how big does the training set have to be for effective deep learning i think i think that was about forty thousand images so like we said uh, before it's got to have quite a substantial size but you can do things like um directly extract um vi video and extract images to then make that train and test split as you saw earlier um, and then you can use Im image augmentation to further improve your networks but yeah, essentially, it's. I would say you need you need a good, probably, uh, five thousand plus images to do anything decent with. And we've got another question, which is in the chat from Matthew, which says, "Have you tried using dropout in between the earlier layers rather than one layer acting on the one-dimensional matrix?" Yeah, yeah, I I, I did uh, toggle with that, Matthew. And some of the inception networks, you actually need to do that and then need to connect it back up. So, yeah, I mean, this was just a novel example. I didn't want to get too complicated because complicated it was already technically enough. But, yeah, there's if you look in the inception, uh, inception modeling uh, architectures, then that can actually show you how to do it. I've got an implementation of that, but it's in Python. But I will try and write a uh, an interface to R so I can actually... Uh, get it working in the R structure as well. And again, I'm a Python user in terms of this. So it's it was a learning curve for me to put it all into R. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, that's that's definitely possible. And I'm really sorry to the other people that have popped their questions in in the last couple of minutes. We need to say a huge thank you to Gary and move into our next session. I think we've been 
switched off so i need to go thanks ever so much gary and i will catch you thanks guys